I think in many ways the situation we are in right now is grotesque. For the first time in history, human civilization itself is at stake. And it is entirely the result of our own actions. I tried to reason about how we came here and what I came up with is a flaw that lies very deep within the structure of our societies that cannot be easily eradicated, that cannot be eradicated within a system that might be meaningfully described as capitalist, and that ensures that such a system will never act reliably with the interests of normal people in mind. For this reason I call it the fundamental flaw of capitalism. I structured this process in five stages and I made some slides which are very bare-bonesy but which I think still get the point across. So we start with an initial stage and this whole process I want to be understood as a model which has been enacted in reality in very different very often in very different times and this model is in some in some sense an abstraction but it is a very exact uh, abstraction we can see it happen again and again and we can see it happen right now so we start with a state which is democratically controlled without loss of generality other forms of government might be possible but since those other forms of government don't even have the interests of the general public in mind we can might as well assume that the state is democratically controlled at the beginning we start with uh, the state controls the wealth distribution through measures such as taxes minimum wages universal basic income any kind of policies which redistribute wealth and I'm going to assume that the state is in some form corruptible. This corruption might be direct, so it might be just people giving po politicians money to see their policies enacted. It might be various forms of indirect corruption. For instance, it might be campaign finance contributions, which are used to push politicians, which, of which people know that they act in their interests. It might even be recruiting people to run for office and then financing their campaign. Or it might be wealthy individuals just directly running for office and financing their campaigns and just drowning out the competition through the monetary advantage. Furthermore, I am going to assume that there exists an initial um, wealth inequality. So. In particular, I'm going to assume that a set of individuals exists that owns more wealth than normal individuals, which I will call the moneyed interests, and I am going to assume that everybody wants more wealth, which is the basic assumption of capitalism. But it is important to note that not every rich person has to act um, the way this model describes in order for it to work. But since this model outlines a process through which rich people can gain more money, it puts people who do not use this process at a, monetar uh, at a competitive disadvantage and so incentivizes rich people to indeed act the way this model describes. Which is again a form of competition that is Similar to the form of competition which Adam Smith describes as being the fundamental motor of capitalism, which I think is a set, has a certain kind of irony in it. So I am going to assume that these moneyed interests use their money in order to increase their influence over the state. Why would they do this? Well, because they can then use their influence over the state to increase their wealth by abolishing taxes abolishing labor laws, abolishing uh, minimum wages, or even by positive measures such as getting the state to finance their industries, to support their industries, as it for instance happens with the banking industry. And 
they can use their influence over the state to further demolish and the corruption measures, making it easier to corrupt the state. And since they have increased their wealth, they can use more wealth to corrupt the state, and it is easier to corrupt the state. So these three, um, these three processes play into each other and um, amplify each other. It is important to note that as this happens, it appears that the state might even get less corrupt, because since more and more ways of corruption become legal, less and less ways of corruption are actually counted as being corrupt. So official statistics don't really tell you in this context about how much corruption is actually at play in a state. And the result of this all is that the wealthy, uh, the moneyed interests gain more and more wealth, they gain more and more influence over the state, and therefore the general public owns more and more, uh, owns less and less relative wealth and has less and less influence over the state. But per definition, the state itself becomes less and less democratic, and more and more measures which are reducing wealth disparity are dismantled, as well as measures which might otherwise um, obstruct the ability of moneyed interests to increase their wealth, as for instance, environmental laws do, or other kinds of laws that ensure that the moneyed interests do not just uh, do not hurt society by pursuing their own self-interest. The result of all this is that the general public becomes more and more angry. And here the moneyed interests have one more trick up their sleeves, which is that they can use the media. So the media controls the information the general public receives and it influences public opinion. But on the other hand, it is easily influenced by money. It is insanely easily influenced by money in most Western societies because it is privately owned. So people can just buy newspapers and fire people who they don't like. And they, the wealthy money interests can use the media to control public opinion, and in particular they can channel the anger the general public feels because their share of wealth gets less and less, uh, gets smaller and smaller, and their control over the state gets smaller and smaller. They can channel this anger and use it to, um, and use it towards other goals. So ideally, they can use this anger to further demolish the state, which is something we see in the US right now very strongly, where the anger the public feels about their um, disadvantages gets um, projected onto the state and used to decrease the power of the state in order for um, the money interests to gain even more power over the state. So they can use the weakness that results in the public anger at the state to further increase their control over the state. It is, it is kind of funny in a way. But at some point, the anger of the general public reaches a critical level and we see some kind of revolution, or at least something resembling a revolution. Now, what happens after this cannot be determined from a model like this. And there have been historically many different phenomena which can be seen in this light. So, for instance, Hitler used the 
general discontent of an impoverished nation and channeled it towards, for instance, Jews and homosexuals. And he promised people a greater share of wealth, which was actually true in a way, because a lot of people were then employed and the public wealth went up, but this was because of war expenses. So the state just financed the war economy and a lot of people were employed that were previously unemployed, but they were employed in weapons factories. On the other side of the ocean, we have Roosevelt, who, as he said himself, behind closed doors, saved the rich people from themselves, but also who first instituted social democratic measures, which, this, uh, which lessened the wealth inequality and ensured a better standard of living for normal people, which let the, which let the anger go down. But we can also say that um, Obama is, um, is to some extent a symptom of this phenomenon, because he used a lot of uh, revolutionary rhetoric and actually used the discontent the public had to getting elected, but he just didn't do anything about it afterwards. Also Trump just ran purely on anger, channeled in every conceivable direction, and he also got elected with it, and he also didn't do much to lessen the anger. <laughs> to the contrary, he tries to um, enlarge the anger because he hopes it will get him re-elected. And maybe Bernie Sanders can actually also use the anger and discontent the general public feels about being this disenfranchised to actually get real reforms implemented which would represent the interests of the general public. But this has still to be seen. But one thing we can observe even from this short sequence of leaders, Obama, Trump and Sanders, is that if the revolutionary tendencies of the general public are not satisfied, it will look for ever more, ever different um, channels to express its discontent until at some point something meaningful happens. So what can we do about this? Well, the first thought would be to for less wealthy people to form organizations and unite in order to increase their influence, which they might not have individually, but which they might have collectively, so that they are on par with wealthy individuals. But this doesn't really solve the problem because organizations which, um, which organize the interests of the general public, let's say, or at least part of the general public, like labor unions or other kinds of unions, become very political organizations in and of themselves. They become very state-like and in particular they become corruptible, which is again something we have seen time and time again. So, mm, yeah, we have seen labor unions over time become so corrupt they don't even really represent the people they are supposed to represent, just as the state doesn't really suppose, uh, represent the general public or the demos. So this is a problem and it is a big problem because right now we see its consequences. Right now we see the US being completely um, having almost no laws on campaign contributions. We see, I think it is about 6,000 lobbyists which are working in Brussels. And we see all these interests just demolishing environmental laws and um, laws that would lessen wealth inequality 
and we see a huge amount of discontent and anger and even pain within the general public. So how can we solve this process? Or how can we solve this problem? I don't really have a satisfying answer. It can't re be really solved within the context of capitalism, at least with a state in place. And without a state, capitalism just becomes, just wreaks havoc on everything. It might get solved with a direct, direct democracy and, or at least it might get lessened with a direct democracy and um, workplace democracy. So collectivization of the means of production, which is just democracy within the context of the economy. But even that I don't think ultimately solves the problem. So this is very hard to actually, to actually solve. But we should be aware of it and we should try to, we should try to at least lessen it as much as we can. I want you to subscribe and click the bell. Also, I want your questions and your feedback. You can send them to me by Facebook, by Twitter and by email. The links are below. Thank you for your time.